Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. The Jesuitical zeal in harvesting souls motivated France's colonial drive as much as the beaver harvest. The European Catholic Counter-Reformation spawned a missionary order that had a huge impact on the North American native peoples. The Jesuits' first community in the interior of North America was called St. Marie among the Hurons. For ten years, it was the headquarters of a network of Jesuit missions that spread all across Huronia and other parts of southern Ontario. The young Jesuit clergymen, known as God's Soldiers, who lived there, put down the first real roots of French culture in the New World. The first Jesuits to come to the New World landed in the St. Lawrence Valley in 1620. They very quickly realized that it would be difficult to convert the local, semi-nomadic Algonquin Indians because they never stayed in one place for very long. Consequently, they decided to concentrate most of their efforts on the more sedentary Huron farmers of Ontario. Soon, black robes, as the native peoples called the Jesuits, were traveling in the canoes of the Indians up the Ottawa River to Huronia. By the 1630s, a number of Jesuit missions had been established in southern Ontario, with their headquarters at St. Marie. This mission was a microcosm of French civilization, complete with a chapel, cemetery, forge, workshops, and a small hospital. Meanwhile, the Jesuits in the St. Lawrence Valley founded a school for Amerindian and French boys in 1635. Four years later, a group of Ursuline nuns arrived to set up a convent school for girls, while the nursing order Religieuse Hospitalière established one of the first hospitals in North America and the first in New France. A group of influential Catholics in France decided that if a mission could be started on the island of Montreal, it might encourage the nomadic Algonquins to settle there permanently so that, like the Hurons of Huronia, they could be transformed into virtuous Catholics. The utopian religious settlement that was built was a reflection of the Catholic cult of the Virgin Mary. They called it Ville Marie, the town of Mary, their new Jerusalem on the banks of the St. Lawrence, today known as Montreal. During a recent interview, I broached this complicated topic. Here are a few excerpts of my thoughts on the matter. One thing that we must always remember is that looking back in history, we have to try and understand what these folks were living through. And one of the things that they experienced was overcoming distance. And as mentioned, 1,500 miles in today's terms can be easily overcome. But back then, it was an adventure of a lifetime when most folks didn't even leave the periphery of their villages. Traveling from Europe to the Americas at the time of colonization was like flying to the moon. I don't think that's overestimated. It's a grand journey. The distances are huge. And those who embark on those journeys and want to meet all the challenges going along, those are a special breed of people. That's why Europeans were so dependent on Amerindians during the first decades and even the first century upon their arrival because they needed Amerindians to survive. Amerindians were used to living in those areas. They had adapted over centuries and even millennia, and they were able to help the Europeans to also adapt and even, in some cases, survive. In the Hurons' village, there is total panic and despair because of diseases. Not understanding the transmission of viruses back then, the people were very wary of the Jesuit priests, the new arrivals, the, the foreigners, who they thought had brought these diseases in some demonic form. It's obviously not the paradise that the young priest was hoping to arrive at. Instead, it is his job to try and find some way of living alongside these people because although he's a new arrival, he's the only one left when the older priest that greeted him died shortly thereafter. The priest actually baptizing the Amerindians and giving them hope that this baptism will free them from this terrible plague, the plague that is killing their villagers. You also get the impression that Amerindians, the Hurons, were not very sincere in their conversion. 
they were basically willing to do anything to get rid of this pestilence and therefore accepted to be baptized and to be, in a way, I guess, traitors to their own culture, but as a means of survival. In other words, we've got nothing to lose at this point. He wants to baptize us. He says that it'll save us. So be it. But the final text gives us the results in that 15 years later, most of the Hurons in that village had died of the pestilence, and the Jesuit priests basically abandoned those missions and went back to Quebec City, and many of them back to France. It was a nuanced and sophisticated and mature look at how the Jesuit priests were trying to do good. Now, we can look back hundreds of years later and say, how dare they have done that? But at the time, they thought they were doing good. They sincerely, in good faith, thought that they were bringing good news to the Amerindians, who were ignorant at the time of Jesus Christ. They were not aware of Christianity, and therefore it was their job and part of their evangelization to get out there, overcome the obstacles, and hopefully convert and baptize these people so that they could one day reach paradise, because that's their ultimate goal. They think they're doing good, and what they're doing will lead to paradise, and also convinced that if the Amerindians accept their message and are converted and baptized, that they too will find paradise. So this is heavy stuff for those folks back then. We can't underestimate that, looking at it from a contemporary or modern viewpoint. This was very serious and important to them. In the same way that the Amerindians, we see how their religion is important to them and how they are convinced that their beliefs will bring them happiness after death. As I mentioned earlier, we cannot underestimate the culture clash and we cannot underestimate the difference in religions and how fervently each group believed in their religion. Canada has different groups of native peoples who are considered Métis, which is an Aboriginal word for a mixture of two cultures, a mixture of the French culture and a mixture of the Amerindian culture. So there was a lot of interaction between both cultures up here in Canada. As there was also elsewhere throughout North America, and the same case can be made for Mesoamerica with regards to the Spanish. So human beings, in whatever place they find themselves, or in whatever civilization or society or culture they find themselves, it all boils down to very basic values. And when you study history for long enough, you realize that all the superficial things that sometimes we focus too much on be it language, color of skin, female, male, culture, regional differences. When you boil all that down, it's a cliche to say we all have so much in common, but I think it's very true. History is complicated. There are accolades for some and blame for others. Too often, present-day historical scholarship focuses on a tale of woe and oppression regarding Western civilization. They ignore the many accomplishments to instead dwell on the negative, the faults, and the shortcomings. A new, fair, delicate balance is needed in our historical analysis. By the way, an interesting topic to research, study, and present, and I'm speaking to the young folks out there, the young budding historians, is the history of history. And what I mean by this is the study of how historians have interpreted and presented the past over time. The 19th century view of Amerindians is regarded now as being much different than ours today. For example, how have native peoples been seen through the historical lens in different eras? What about the evolution of the word savage? The actual word savage, or sauvage in French, has evolved over the centuries and has been used differently, different connotations. The pendulum of historical interpretation too often swings from one extreme to the other. This indelible fact should be brought to light. In the end, I find that if you're working, studying, and interpreting in the middle zone, that's where you'll often find the truth. It's been a real pleasure, and I hope we get to do it again soon. I hope you enjoyed these interview excerpts. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride. Yeah.